It's Monday, July 30th. I'm Scott. I'm Rim. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, we talk briefly about portable audio recorders while Rim suffers. Let's do this. Well, after the weekend of Otakon and the week at the shore, we're back. We're bad. Uh, I'm a little sick still. A little sick? You're a lot sick. I'm only a little sick now. I was a lot sick during the week. You see, Otakon was well and good, but uh, I caught... Well, actually, Emily got sick at the con. The Oda flu, as it were. And I didn't exhibit symptoms until the second day at the shore. And I recovered mostly, but as a result, I couldn't talk for most of our quote-unquote writer's retreat. So... The crew got to hang out in a very strange environment where Rim is mostly quiet. Yeah, and uh, I didn't get sick. I wonder why that is. Nah, I got pretty bad sinuses. I always have. Why don't you get some sort of permanent fixing going on? Because there's no such thing. There's a such thing. No, there isn't. Some form of sinus surgery or something. Nah, there's nothing that can be done about that. Ah, don't suck in the first place. Anyway, I'm mostly back. I can talk now. I just have to talk quietly. I've got the gain way up on my microphone, and I'm trying not to strain myself. But at least we're here doing a show. Yeah, I guess doing a show sick is better than not doing a show at all. And I got a few quick bits. I know a lot of other podcasters that would just give up. I know a lot of podcasters who give up for far less than we give up. I know a lot of t- professional TV people who just be like, oh, my voice is slightly eh, not coming in today. Yeah, so take that, internet. Yeah. But before we get started, we have a bunch of errata and all that from last week. To all of you new listeners, I'm sure you are aware that last week was mostly filler episodes. A lot of you are probably from Otakon. You're probably wondering where your Otakon coverage is. Uh, you're going to have to wait till Wednesday. You see, Monday for Geek Nights here is science and technology and computers and Linux and all that crap. And you want me to continue because you don't want to talk. So on Tuesday, we talk about the video games and sometimes the board games and even more rarely the RPGs. But we might actually talk about those more often. We're going to have a lot more RPG talk as time comes on because we're going to start playing pretty much everything that Luke Crane ever said a word about when we talk to him. Yep. Uh, and the Wednesdays, we cover the animes and the mangas and the comics and the visual arts of geekiness. So... That is the day where your Otakon coverage will reside, because Otakon is a convention of otaku generation, which is mostly the anime and the manga. Also a kind of crappy podcast. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But also, if you are one of those anime fans, since I figure most of you, and I saw a lot of you hitting the feed, so I know you're there. If you're looking for anime stuff, I suggest that you listen to two weeks ago on Wednesday. We had a normal episode. We reviewed Kineticon. And I'd suggest to all of you who might have been looking for it, last Wednesday, we had special guest hosts, Dave and Joel from Fast Karate for the Gentlemen, do one of the best episodes of Geek Nights that has ever been aired. But Rim screwed up. You see, we uploaded the episode in advance. However, we uploaded it well beyond the quota on Libsyn. And so Rim uploaded it, and he checked it, and he said, all is well. And And all was well. I listened to it from Libsyn. I sent the link to Dave and Joel. I was like, check this out. It works. Yep. And then, uh, you know, I set it to automatically post to the website and everything. Yep. And the Monday posted just fine. The Monday to the Tuesday posted just fine. There was no Thursday to all of you who are saying we screwed that up too. We were going to make a Thursday episode similar to the Thursday episode from the last uh, week of Awesome, but (laughs) Rim said, oh, we'll just make it tomorrow morning, uh, and then we didn't. Well, the reason I said that was that we recorded, what, like five various episodes in bits? That day? Yeah, but it wouldn't have taken long to make that tiny five-second episode. It was already like 11, and I hadn't even packed for Oticon yet. It, it took me like 10 minutes to pack for Oticon. Whatever. Yeah. Anyway, the point is there wasn't a Thursday episode. We could probably go back and put a Thursday episode there. We could. But if you tried to listen to the Dave and Joel, it is up now. It has been up since uh, actually yesterday. Yep. But it... Uh, Rim went over the Libsyn quota, and it got deleted. Yes, I do this podcast great, by myself, and we, I put it over the quota. We went through great effort to uh, get it uploaded again. Yeah, we, you want to hear a funny story? My computer, currently, my awesome new computer, there's a problem with Linux and the onboard NIC, which doesn't manifest in Windows, it's only Linux, and it basically makes my NIC periodically throw out a lot of bad packets. I'll have to investigate this problem with closer scrutinies. 
But uh, yeah, there's a problem with his network card and his computer and his Linux. Something. Thus, we weren't able to, through all of our magic, log into my computer from afar and upload We went it. through such great technological feats that I will not describe because they'll probably be bore many people, even though it's a Monday show. We should do a show on remote access, though. We should do a show on remote access. But basically, we connected to the server in the sky, and from there, we went through a VPN to, mo- to a computer in the house... And then and from, from there, there, we told the router to open up a port so we could reconfigure the router to open up a port to... Well, we made an SSH tunnel so that we could visit the router with a web browser, reconfigure the router to open a port to RIM's computer, connect it directly to RIM's computer, and then failed to do so because RIM's computer has this problem. Yep. Even worse was before that, I had to get Emily, who was at home, to turn my computer on. And I thought, all right, I'll just call her and get her to turn my computer on. And then I realized as I walked her through all the steps, that it is not a trivial process to turn my computer on. Well, the problem is you turned off the power in all different places. I turned off the power on my computer in only two places, not all three places. Well, part of it, I turned the UPS off. Well, I guess technically four places if you count the circuit breaker. So I had the UPS and the power supply switch in the back and then the switch in the front. Luckily, it boots to Linux by default, so I didn't have to mess with any of that. Yeah, I only turned off the power supply switch and the computer itself, not the UPS. I kept my UPS on because it also powers my clock. But, of course, I got home and the clock was screwed up anyway. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Which is awesome. That's why I don't put the 9-volt battery in my clock. I just put the I just plug the clock into my UPS. See, I used to plug my clock into the UPS, but I rearranged my bedroom, and now the UPS is too far away, and I'm not going to buy another UPS. We already have, what, four? You, oh, yeah, well, you can use the extension cord. Though. I'm not going to run an extension cord halfway around my room for okay, that. Okay, then get the 9-volt battery. I'm going to get the 9-volt battery. That's a good plan. Too. Actually, I'm thinking of getting a new alarm clock. I've had the same alarm clock since, like... You can get one of those fancy ones with the iPod dock. I don't need that. I'm using an alarm clock from, like, 1990. You could get the old-fashioned kind that's mechanical with the hammer that goes back and forth between two, two bells. ding a ding a ding a ding a See, I've only had two alarm clocks in my life. I had the one I had now. I use it now. That sound, the sound my alarm clock na- makes, I could hear that from, like, a mile away. It's the worst <laughs> sound in the world, as far as I can tell, because that has ruined dreams and woken me up for work and school for well over a decade. Yep. Before that, I had a Care Bears alarm clock that, (laughs) when it rang, it was louder than anything you've ever... I don't know how it was so loud, but my parents actually gimped it so it wouldn't be so loud, so we wouldn't wake up screaming every morning. I had uh, had this alarm clock that was clear, right? You could, like, see through it, and it was, you know, it was a standard alarm clock, and I had that for a long time. And then, uh, I don't know what happened to it. I don't remember it breaking, but I, eventually it was gone, and I got the one I have now, which is a Radio Shack one, which is, I got it, must have been in high school sometime, I don't know. But the point is, one time, my mom ordered me a Super Mario alarm clock. Ooh. It was the kind with the hammer and the two bells. And she ordered it from the JCPenney catalog, and we went to the JCPenney counter to pick it up. And it was broken, so she sent it back, and she didn't get me a new one. Ah, oh, Rob. So I never had a Mario alarm clock, even though I should have had a Mario alarm clock. They and should... I, if I had that Mario alarm clock, I'd probably still have that Mario alarm they clock. They should make a new Mario alarm clock, one that plays, I don't I'm know. I'm sure in Japan they have Mario alarm clocks. Let's get one. All right, sure. Right, anyway, and my last little bit of errata here. If I sound different, it's because my throat is a wreck. It's a piece I'm... of shit. My throat is a bloody wreck. Everyone that- donate us money. You, I don't. Ah. A- we don't ask for money, but Rim needs a new larynx, so money is needed See, it's now. funny. I've always had problems with my voice. I lose my voice pretty easily. And over the years, like last Oticon, Scott and I both lost our voices. I- Not from doing live shows. We survived all that. The problem at Oticon is it's crowded and loud, and you, we talk a lot. Mostly to oh, other people. we talk a lot. No one would have ever guessed that. Yeah. And when you talk a lot and it's loud, you talk loudly so people can hear you. It's like talk. if I talked at a concert the whole night, I would lose my voice because I'd be talking over the concert a lot. Well, and- even worse is the fact that the front row crew as a whole, generally, especially more so in the past than now, centers around us. And if we don't take charge, nothing gets done. We're, we're starting to wean everyone off of that. But back then, that year, we pretty much herded the entire crew around the entire con. And we made all the dinner arrangements and involved a lot of yelling to get people, we're going to this restaurant at 8, meet us there. I'm going back to the hotel room. You've got the hotel key, right? Yep. And thus, we lost our voices. This year... We pretty much told everyone to go screw themselves and deal with it on their own. We spent much of the con sitting at our artist alley table, taking turns talking to uh, random passers-by. 
Yeah, I still, I almost lost my voice at that artist alley that day. At least I tired it out because I would be like, you want to take the fanboy feud survey? Blah, blah, blah. Do you know about podcasts? Blah, blah, blah. You don't need an iPod. You don't need an iPod. Blah, blah, blah. What was the, the other thing? Oh, Carcassonne. This is what Carcassonne is. Yep. We had three things that I, three spiels I had to give. And, and we it, took, we kind of took turns giving the different ones as one of us would rest. And it was, it was a good time. It was good times. But uh, three spiels over a loud artist alley. Tiring. But at least I, because my voice goes bad much easier than Scott's. I actually read a bunch of things about how vocalists and singers and people don't lose their voices. And it works. They're, they're for, not born with larynxes of rim. So it worked pretty well, actually, the techniques. You know, breathing right and making sure I make the voice come from the right part of the throat and open everything up and all that business. And I didn't lose my voice at all at Oticon. I lost my voice when I got sick and the post-nasal drip destroyed me. Yep. Anyway, let's, yep. Uh, let's talk about tech stuff. And all right, Scott. We'll talk so about the rest later. What do you got in the news since we missed, I don't know, almost two weeks worth of internet? Well, there was so much internet, actually, I just sort of marked all my RSS feeds as red because I don't care. It's not worth me my time to read like 2,000 items of RSS news when maybe 100 of them I actually care about. But one thing did catch my eye, and that is that the Koan iAudio 7 is now available in the United States. Uh-huh. You can get the 8-gig one, which is red, for $220, about, or the 4-gig silver one for $160. Now, why is this news that there's a new MP3 player? Well, one... Uh, think about how big those are compared to how much they cost, and compare them to, say, I don't know, an iPod. Well, yeah, but also, let me discuss why the Kawan iAudio 7 is such an important player that you should take note of, especially if you're the kind of person who wants a portable audio and maybe video player, wants a small one and does not want an iPod and doesn't want to be beholden to any sort of, you know, DRM-type things or anything like that. The Kawan iAudio 7 is an mp3 player it's also a video player but it kind of sucks as a video player because you need to convert videos with a special tool to play on it but regardless of that it plays mp3s flax and augs without problem just plays them there's barely any other players that do that it's got flash it works as just a normal drive it has a normal usb hole in the bottom of it no weird plugs at all so you plug it in usb it looks like a drive you drag files onto it you're done on the front, it's got, like, you know, the stop button and the play button. And it's got this slidey thing that lets you, like, slide around like an iPod. It also lets you click forward and click back just once. And it also lets you hold down either end of the slidey bit to go really fast. So it gives you, actually, a lot more flexibility in moving around the menus than the iPod really does. And uh, it's cheap. And it's awesome. The only thing that's wrong with it is that uh, the volume control, or or there's extra buttons on the side for volume control and mode change. Uh, it does have a microphone, and I'm pretty sure it can record things. And uh, Not that we care about that anymore. Not that we care about that. Yeah, we'll get to that. And uh, I would say that if you are the kind of person who needs a portable media-playing device and does not want an iPod, this is the new winner. The only major problem I see with it is that it is about... You know, it's about the size of an iPod Nano face-wise, and you know, maybe even smaller, but it's about as thick as three or four iPod Nanos. That's not so bad. It's not a deal-breaker, but it's still kind of... However, as a result, the battery... Guess how long the battery lasts? I don't know, uh, seven years. Sixty hours. That's not too bad. My iPod Nano, which isn't that old, already only lasts a couple hours. Mine lasts like six-ish hours. When it was new, it lasted seven-ish hours, so... 60 hours. Dams. <laughs> this thing, you just don't need to plug it in. So, uh, yeah. Cool. Anyone listening to this on their computer, go buy this player and listen to it on that instead. I don't know. I'm still kind of holding out. I think I'm going to keep my sem semi-crappy but yet functional iPod Nano. Oh, I didn't say I'm going to run out and buy oh, no. this. I think my plan in general is I'm going to keep this thing until the perfect MP3 player appears, and then I will pay almost any amount of money to have that. So I'm basically, right now, my phone and my iPod, I'm going to keep them until they are dead. And the point at which they are dead, I will, you know, find, the, if, the, if the best thing does not exist yet, I will just continue traveling the low, cheap road of subsistence until the perfect thing comes. Of course, the perfect thing is pretty much... Wi-Fi, subscribe to podcasts on it, and it just downloads them whenever it gets internet access. Only ever have to plug it into charge. 
Removable, rechargeable battery that yep. lasts forever. You want to configure it? It's just a website. Completely free of DRM. Just put files on it. Yeah. Good interface. Small. So anyway, I bring this up only because it's kind of relevant to what happened at Oticon. But apparently a lot of you might have seen this. But Fox 11, which is for Los Angeles, the local guy there did some sort of uh, expose on this band of terrorists called you, Anonymous. I'm not 100% sure this is actually a real Fox News story. Is I'm it? at www.myfoxla.com. Uh, my Fox LA. That's not like fox.com slash LA or something. It's a tough call. Um, I'm pretty sure this is legitimate, Scott. No, I'm just saying. Anyway, this is a video of someone who really doesn't seem to understand what the internet is about and a bunch of other people who are victims of the internet, partly because they don't understand what it's really about, talking about the evil terrorist ways of places like 4chan. Now, for those of you who don't know, 4chan is pretty much just a sea of pornography. Mostly the Futanari variety. Yeah, something like that. Don't look that word up. Do not. You, you really don't, don't. If you don't know what Futanari is, you don't want to know what Futanari is. F-U-T-A-N-A-R-I. See, I'm glad you spelled it. Now, this is kind of like back in the day when you kept hearing people say Goatsy or Tub Girl. And you'd think, I wonder what that is. And they'd say, oh, you don't want to know. But then you got curious. And then you looked. And then you realized that they were right. Well, you don't want to know what Futanari is. See, to is. me, I think that the Futanari, no one on 4chan actually likes it. I think that is 4chan's defense against normal people. Normal people go in, see that, and go, ah, I do not ah. think that, it is, that Futanari is, uh, I do not think defense is the only purpose of Futanari on 4chan, but it is one of the purposes of having that there. It must have some other hidden purpose that we don't know about. Maybe uh, it's code. People who like Futanari go to 4chan. I can't imagine there's that many people who like Futanari. I think there's a lot of people who secretly like Futanari. I don't know. I don't see the appeal. But then again, there's a lot of things I don't see the appeal I don't. In. I don't see the appeal either, but uh, yeah. One, I'd suggest you watch this because it's kind of hilarious. And two, I would like to point out that our friends Pete and James at Oticon did a documentary. They had a, James had a camera. And or at least a portion of a documentary. Yeah, they started a documentary of 4chan, and they filmed the line to get into the panel. They couldn't actually film the panel because they wouldn't let cameras into the panel. This is quickly turning into an Oticon uh, review show. Yeah, well, it's kind of, people want to hear about this. We'll talk about this more once it's done, but suffice to say... The video footage that they got from the 4chan line at Oticon was uh, interesting. Sea King? Fuck yeah. That's the only one we're going to do. I think 4chan has infected the front row crew a little bit, but more importantly, I think they're going to go all the way and make an actual documentary because I think, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase Pete, but he basically said, I went in expecting to see something hilarious and make fun of it. I came out somewhat shaken and realized that there's something far deeper and more profound and at the same time all the more horrifying going on here. Yep. Okay. I... The, the real moral of this news story, however, is very simple. People who don't understand the internet don't seem to realize that the internet is the wild, wild west and you've got to protect yourself. It's not that there's some evil anonymous clan out to get you. It's that you haven't protected yourself from the internet. It's not that hard to do. You, I, I like how they seem to think that there's an actual group calling itself anonymous that is doing these bad things as opposed to just, you know, anonymous people. I don't know. Yes, people fear what they do not understand. This is old and known. Consider this a preview because we're going to do a show probably in the next couple of weeks on 4chan and anonymity and all that. And of course, John Gabriel's greater internet fuckwad theory. Oh, the most important theory on, uh, of all internet knowings. Well, so much for more talk about that. It looks like it's time for Things of the Day. I hate to have to explain this again, but since we have a bunch of new listeners, I figure I might as well at least warn you that this is the part of the show where we talk about the things we've seen that might have been hilarious on the internet recently. Well, I haven't been on the internet for like a week and a half, so you're getting something that's right at the top because I just cleared out everything. I am not looking back. If anything cool happened on the internet... And last week, I don't know about it. So if you actually send me a link, I won't say, that's so old, I've seen that. I'll say, awesome, something I haven't seen. But make sure it's from the last week. If it's from two weeks ago, you'll be puns. Yeah. All right, so what do you got for me? So check this video, right? There's someone, they have a house, and they're sitting in the house looking at their front door from, the, feel, ins from the inside. I feel like your story should be interspersed with Brack. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, dun, dun. And they look at 
The doggy door. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> All right, that's enough of that. All right. And through the doggy door comes one of the uh, better animals, the raccoon. <laughs> I really like raccoons. Raccoons I- are all right. Except Thing for is, the rabid ones. I like the I like raccoons because one, they have little human hands and they manipulate things and they pick stuff up and they're very they're very intelligent looking. And they seem to have some sort of glimmer of understanding of what they're about to do, especially when it's something mischievous. I don't know. I like the idea of raccoons more than actual raccoons. But anyway. Well, the thing is, I've never had actual raccoons mess with any of my stuff, so I have no qualms with Oh, they with used them. to mess with our trash all the time. We had to seal that trash up with some bungee cords or else they'd be getting in there. We just had a really heavy lid on the trash, and the raccoons couldn't get to it. Yeah, our trash, not heavy lids. We also had dogs. Yep. Anyway, this raccoon pokes through the doggy door. Dum-dum-dum. And he reaches into the house, like, with half his body, but not the other half of his body. And they're sitting there videotaping this raccoon. And it's just sitting there like, hey, what's up? With its glowy eyeballs and its evil burglar mask. And it, it grabs this little rug sitting by the front door. And, and it pulls it out the doggy door. It steals it. It, it, it. A raccoon wearing a burglar mask broke into their house and stole their carpet. Oh my, OMG, raccoons in your house stealing your carpets. <laughs> I has a rug. <laughs> that's, that's his video. So over the week, which... We in the Front Row crew every year call the Week of Awesome, the week we spend usually down in Wildwood at our friend Scott Johnson's house instead of, you know, wherever else we'd go, just uh, sleeping on the beach and doing all sorts of things. Uh, We spent part of it with uh, Yuko and Anath, and the two of them kept making some inside jokes, and eventually they realized that I did not understand the inside jokes because I had not seen the video to which they were referring. Read a book. They then tried to find said video, and it was uh, taken down from most of the places it had been posted. That's because most of the places it was posted, well, it was posted on YouTube, and just about every other result on Google was a link to the YouTube that was taken down. I think there were a couple of different YouTubes taken down. Even so, there were all links to YouTube where it was taken down. Suffice to say, if the link to this thing of the day breaks, just keep looking for it, you'll find it somewhere. If anything, it might re-air at some point. Perhaps, if we only watch television. Now, people try to show us stuff for things of the day all the time, and I, I was like, all right, whatever, just show it to me later. But they persisted. They decided that it was too good to let go, and they spent a good while looking for it. And uh, eventually they found it, and they showed it to me. And I can't pretend that I didn't laugh out loud. It's, it's too awesome. Should we, should we go through the lyrics one at a time and then just have, let, leave it at that? Well, first off, this is something that actually aired on television, on BET, Black Entertainment Television. It was a written, recorded, and produced by Bomani Amer, a.k.a. Not a Rapper. Yep. Seems like a pretty cool guy, too. I'm kind of interested in the rest of his music now. Although he does say that he's not a rapper. He's a poet with a hip-hop styling, which is a rapper. That's like saying, I'm not a string. I'm just some elongated cloth used to tie things up. I'm not a car. I'm just a four-wheeled vehicle used to transport people around town. That's basically what this guy's saying. That's the only thing I can find wrong with him, though. Everything else is cool so far. From what I can gather, though I didn't research this too deeply, he made this song, and BET decided that they liked it, and they wanted to get their team to animate it for him, and then they made a music video. Yeah, it, it's actually, I'm usually not a fan of the music videos, but this one's pretty good. I like it. It's, it's good stuff. A uh, quote from this article, this video is a great example of how the best animation can convey complex messages with great clarity and humor. Now... I would like to warn all of you that the video is not safe for work. Well, only because it has bad words. Yeah, and uh, some of you may or may not be offended by this, but I would like to point out also that Scott and I are not racist, and I contend that this video is not racist either. This video has nothing to do with race. This video has everything to do with hip-hop culture, regardless of whether or not you're white, black, or purple. Well, not so much the hip-hop culture, but you know, a certain part of the hip-hop culture. A subset is, of the hip-hop yes, culture that involves is, spinner rims. Yes, because there is also the hip-hop culture. That's actually the largest subset of the hip-hop culture. Because I there is the sex subset of hip-hop culture, which is all cool and underground and caring about poetry and music that is separate. There's also the uh, subset, a.k.a. Nerdcore. There are many cores, but we're mostly talk- targeting the main core. So the primary lyric, the chorus, if you will, of this work is... Read a book, read a book, read a motherfucking book. And uh, what are the other ones? Let's see. Uh, Buy land, brush your teeth, 
uh, wear deodorant. Speed stick. <laughs> it's called speed stick. It's, it's not, not expensive. expensive. <laughs> it's called speed stick. It's not expensive. I highly recommend you watch this. I find it absolutely hilarious. I see myself watching it two more times tonight, <laughs> at least. Well, we have to show it to Emily when she gets home. Oh, absolutely. I got to get an MV3 put on my iPod. <laughs> I got to say, I'm going to check out the rest of this guy's music, though. Yeah. You can buy it on iTunes if you're into that sort of thing. So, our main bit tonight going to be a little bit short because my throat is pretty much at the end of its wits right now. I don't know how much longer I'll be able to talk. It's wits end, not the end of its wits. See, when I start saying something wrong, I can't just, you know, oh, I had a cue and edit it out. I got to really be judicious with the words I use. So why are you saying a bunch of useless words right now when your voice is running out? Because my pride demands that I cover it up. <laughs> All right, so tonight we're going to talk about portable audio recorders. Now, basically, we as podcasters have a great need for a portable audio recorder. By that, I mean a device which you can carry, is powered by batteries, and which can take an audio input signal and save it and then later deliver that signal to be used for other purposes. And, uh, well, we used to, you know, these devices have been around for a long time. I mean, cell phones can do this. Uh, freaking, they used to have t little tiny tape recorders that could do this. They still do. You can get a device that does this all over the place. But we've never needed one, really, in our lives. Even though, I mean, I've had cell phones that could do it. And I've had uh, other things that could do it. And I just never used that feature because it wasn't something we needed. Yep, I mean, in high school I used that stuff a lot. But I could just borrow the dat from the music teacher if I needed to record anything. I had a Fisher-Price tape recorder as a kid that had a built-in microphone. I did, too. I actually, apparently, my brother and I recorded a little radio show all the time. And I'm trying to find out if my mom still has the tapes laying around. No. Oh. That'll be some Geek Night specials for you. Rim, <laughs> age five. Awesome. But yeah, anyway, as podcasters, we were looking for a new one. You know, something we could actually use for the podcast. So that way when we went to a convention, mostly conventions, but also other places, we could record what went on there without having to carry a computer around or anything like that. Yeah, last year's Oticon, we brought the Mac and the monitor and the compressor and the mixer and all the microphones and everything. And uh, that worked sucked. really well. But I got to say, putting that stuff in, packing it up, taking it out, putting it back together was totally not worth it. It sucked ass, basically. Even though the episode we recorded with all that is still our most popular episode. <laughs> but anyway, so we started looking for a solution to the problem. And all the other podcasters were using these iRiver thingies. And, well, the iRiver is basically an MP3 player that happens to also be able to record audio. And uh, I wasn't really a fan of that so much. And it didn't seem like it made the highest quality recordings. Yeah, I mean, I'll admit, whenever I tried to listen to other people's podcasts and they tried to interview anyone, the audio was usually atrocious. Yeah. Like, unlistenable. So the Eye River was no good. So he said, all right, let's go to the Best Buy and see what they got. And they have, at the Best Buy, audio recorders. They got tape ones, which... Tape ones, while they are useful, if you're just, like, trying to record a lecture or if you're, say, interrogating someone, or taking personal notes as you walk around, you know, and observing things at the zoo, maybe. Not too useful for uh, us podcasting, mostly because it's not digital. Yep, meaning I have to sit there and at one-to-one -one time record onto my computer from the tape to get the data off of it. And uh, I actually borrowed one of these from my friend Scott Johnson at KatsuCon like two years ago. And I went around trying to interview people to, you know, do stuff with the audio. And I learned that when I came home and I had this tape full of audio, there was not a single functional tape player in our entire house. There's there actually the thing you can buy for your computer that goes in a five and a quarter inch bay that will, if you put cassette tapes into it, will convert them to digital file formats with a, uh, a piece of software. Yeah, but by then it was too late. Yes, of course. We're not going to go out and buy one of those devices for a one-time use anyway. The first thing failed. The second thing I put it into, because we, we had a bunch of them. Just, none of them worked. The second one destroyed the tape. Ah. I re-spooled it into a different cassette, and then three and four also failed. And then I gave up, and I think I threw the cassette away. Good idea. Anyway, so tapes suck. We didn't want to deal with tapes. Plus, we'd have to buy tapes. Fuck that, right? So we bought this Sony thing, and until someone dropped it and broke it... Ahem. It, uh, it worked, but shittily. Basically... The audio quality it recorded was bad. It recorded at low bit rates. 
But if you plugged a microphone into the hole on the bottom of it and you ran filter, you did post production on the audio, it wasn't too bad. Granted, it was an eighth inch jack. So I had to convert to a quarter inch and then plug in like a big Radio Shack microphone. So the microphone was bigger than the recorder. Yes. Also, the recorder, uh, you know, it didn't have too much space, but it could hold a lot, pl- enough hours of music and enough battery time. But to get the music off of the recorder, there was DRM. DRM on something I recorded out in the real world by pushing a button. We had what to run the s- hell? special crappy Windows software that didn't work in Linux or the Mac to get the audio off. Yes, yeah, Sony then- provided the software. Is a Sony, by the way, of course. Sony gave this special software. It was the only way to get the stuff off of the player. And as soon as you got it off the player, the DRM was gone. It was a wave or an MP3. So what the fuck? Why have the DRM in the first place? Just make MP3s on a disc. God damn it. It was one of the crappiest things ever, but it was still like 80 bucks. Yeah, but it broke. Yeah, well, it was broken. Yes. 80 bucks down the toilet. So yeah. That didn't work. I out. got a few interviews out of it, but it just it was kind of crappy. And also, while it served the purpose of walk around a con and interview people, kind of okay. It didn't serve all the other purposes, like... Record a backup stream of audio or plug it into a panel and record the whole panel. Yes, another reason we wanted a portable audio recorder is that what we could set up is we could take an output from our mixer. Because one output from the mixer goes to the computer where it's recorded and turned into the show. We could take another output from the mixer and send it into the portable recorder. Thus, if the com- something happens to the computer, the portable device has batteries. So we won't lose the show, basically, no matter what happens, if we simultaneously record the show to the backup portable recorder. And, of course, the Sony thing could not do that. So we started looking for devices. We needed a device that was a portable recorder, recorded relatively high quality, had sufficient battery life and recording hours, uh, wasn't too big and heavy and stupid, wasn't crazily stupid expensive that we couldn't afford it, and when you plugged it into a computer to get the files off was just MP3 files or just WAV files that didn't give us shit and didn't require special software. Now, I, I did a bunch of research. I did a bunch of research as well. And basically, I found that there, a device that we wanted does not really exist so much. I mean, there were the low-end devices like the Sony thing. And those things are garbage. They're not worth the money. Yep, unless you're basically walking around <laughs> doing personal crappy recording, not for a podcast or anything. And then there's the hack-together solutions like buy the thing to stick into your iPod or yep. buy the thing. And- all the, the entire mid-range product line where all these <laughs> turn your MP3 player into a recorder or get an MP3 player that's also a recorder, like the Creative Zen thing, which is also a recorder. And uh, those things take pretty crappy audio. Yes. You got to fiddle with them. They don't always work so well. And also, you can't plug a real microphone into them. Yep. I mean, some of them you can, but... Well, not a real microphone. Yes. For the most part, they're better than the Sony craps, but they're not dedicated recording devices. They're MP3 players that happen to be able to record, or they're cell phones that happen to be able to record, or they're smart trios that happen to be able to record, and they aren't really well suited to the recording. You just happen to be able to do it sufficiently and i wasn't about to go and buy an mp3 player just for the recording feature and from what i read all the ones that would work on our ipods were really really crappy and they're also really expensive yes mostly because we had ipod nanos they were pretty expensive but even if we had a regular ipod and not a nano the thing that makes it record decently is still like 200 dollars, which is a lot of freaking money but the problem was the next step up was basically professional audio recorders in the $600 to $1,200 range. Yeah, I mean, if you didn't get the MP3 player, there wasn't, like, a $300 product that was an awesome recorder for podcasters. That doesn't exist. I couldn't find one anywhere. The only, the next best thing was a $500 badass recorder that, like, professional TV and radio NPR-type people would use to do interviews in the field or, like, uh, police would use to, you know... Uh, interrogate, record interrogations, and FBI people would use. There wasn't any mid-range product. So think about this. On one end, the top of the budget scale for consumers, because pretty much I think the real issue here is that they don't make these products for consumers at all. And I can think of a lot of reasons why they might not. There isn't a great demand other than podcasters. and Also, I mean, back with debt and all that, there was definitely this idea that the recording industry as a whole wanted to keep professional recording equipment out of the hands of the public because that, that made true. it easy to pirate things. That's why debt was so hideously crippled if you bought anything that cost a reasonable amount of money. Yeah, I mean, imagine if people could get awesome, badass recorders, right? Actual things that recorded in quality 
and brought them to concerts instead of bringing tiny little tape recorders or using their cell phone to record, then they can get it for like 300 bucks. That'd be pretty dangerous because people would have awesome concert recordings as opposed to scratchy bootleg concert recordings. So between the, in the gap here, on one end, you've got like the $80 piece of crap with a 16 megabyte flash in it that you can't even remove and DRM all over. And then you've got the Marantz PMD 660, which we ended up buying. Yeah, we basically bought the lowest end professional thing we could find. I mean, we could have gotten the 670, you know, or the I kind of wanted seven. the 670. Yes, it was basically we could get an even fancier professional thing, but we didn't. We got the least professional professional thing because it was the cheapest thing that met our needs and we didn't have another choice. Now, the thing is, this thing is badass and it met all of our needs 100%. It's got two XLR inputs, phantom power. It's got a million different modes. You don't even modes. need the phantom power. It just takes flash. It'll record like 170 hours the way we've got it set up right now. Yeah. The only complaints I have about the device is that it takes four AA batteries and they don't last very long if you're actually recording. They last about four hours. Not long enough considering the fact that with my four gig compact flash card, I can record like an ungodly number of hours of audio. Luckily, I can mitigate that. I'm thinking of just buying a lithium battery pack for it. That sounds like a good idea. They're not that much money, surprisingly, and they're actually made for this device. Yep. Good things about the device, basically everything. It records in high quality. Even though a lot of people on the internet were complaining about the preamps on the device being shitty, uh, it's good enough for us, and it's way better than any consumer product. It's good enough for 90% of people. Yeah. I, I mean, in the audio, you can see the problems with the preamps. Those problems are not going to be apparent. In there, if it's really a problem for you and you need perfect quality, there are people that are actually selling this device with, they, they replace the preamps for you with better ones and then sell you the device. And if you really need it, that you can go that route. Of course, you could also just use the line in and use your own preamp. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. But basically, the thing, it records, it plays back, it can record multiple tracks, it can uh, auto-level, it can... It, it, God, it does everything. It can edit the audio on the device. You, you, The device is a USB drive, so you can just get the audio off, or you can take the compact flash out and plug it into a compact flash reader and get the files that way, because they're just... Wave in MP3 files, and they just work. Yep. A nice side effect of that is if you need to, you can use this as a straight-up card reader in your computer. Yeah, if you need a compact flash reader. The problem is it's a, one, it's a USB 1.0 compact flash reader, so it's a little bit slow, but it's, it's freaking useful as all hell. It's got a pretty good stereo mic built in. Yep. Uh, yeah, if you just put it on a table and push record without using any external microphones, it can record pretty well. I recorded almost everything we did at Oticon. Most of that I'm not going to put in the show. The quality's not good enough, but not because of the device, but just because of the setup of recording. Yep. Part of that is due to the fact that as much as I love Oticon, their AV teams are really good except for giving me an audio feed. Yep. Every time I ever try to get an audio feed out of them, it's the signal-to-noise ratio is to the point that it's absolutely useless. Yeah, because basically at Oticon, there's these people, they contract out all their AV to a company I call DSL, and... They provide the projectors and the screens and the audios and the microphones and the mixers and all that stuff to all the rooms at Oticon that need AV. And they do a good job. And, you know, you always see the DSL techs running around doing what they're supposed to do and they get the job done. But because this is equipment that's used often at a lot of conventions and things, and it's, you know, that company makes a lot of money if they don't replace their equipment. Also, as I look, the way they set the equipment up is not optimal for what I want to do. Also, basically, all they care about is people sitting in front of the room talking to a microphone and the audio comes out of the speakers without hurting people. That's what they care about. So making sure that the signal-to-noise ratio is good or that it's nice, you know, there'll be a nice recording signal coming out of their mixer is not one of their high priorities. So it's difficult to record panels at Oticon through the equipment, at least. Yeah, but anyway, since I have this device and we have all that recording time, we're recording everything we do mostly so we can listen to ourselves and improve. Yep, which is good. And, you know, archival footage. Maybe we'll make some uh, specials or extras out of funny things that might have happened. Yep. So in the end, if you're someone who needs to record audio out in the wild, you can get a piece of crap if that suits your needs, if you don't care about quality or anything like that, and you don't care about using pain-in-the-ass software to actually get the audio off the device, or if you never even want to get the audio off the device at all, then there's plenty of things you can just pick up for like 50 bucks at the store. If you need something better than that, 
You're pretty much going to have to buy something professional or suffer with a lesser solution that doesn't do everything you want. And the lowest professional <laughs> thing will do everything you want and probably more than what you want unless you are a professional. And it sucks. Yeah, though what this has all taught me, and I've been leaning this way before. I think I've talked about it once or twice, but now I'm pretty much solid in this belief. I, there are only two classes of purchases for me in my life at this point. If I need something, I will either buy the cheapest thing that will get the jo job done minimally, or I'm going to buy exactly what I want. I'm not going to buy some middle ground compromise anymore. Yep, that's what I'm doing. Basically, if I need to do something... I'm either going to get the pe the most bargain I can get, something that does the job for like five bucks. Like what I do with cell phones. I take whatever cell phone is free no matter what. Until the perfect cell phone arrives. Which currently doesn't exist for a price I'm willing to pay. Actually, I'd say it doesn't exist at it all. It doesn't exist. Not in the U.S. anyway. Yeah. Which means it's not perfect for me. So, yeah, I'm going to buy the cheap bargain thing for five bucks that gets the job done even though I have to suffer. I save a lot of money on it and I get the job done. I don't care. Unless the perfect product exists that fits my needs exactly, in which case I will pay almost any price, and I will get that device. And uh, portable audio recorders, basically, we bought the bargain price, and it basically didn't get the job done. Not so only did we, it not get the job done, it got broken immediately. So we, we basically, we bought the cheapest thing that will get the job done while simultaneously buying something expensive that meets all our needs because they were the same product because <laughs> nothing less than that would have gotten the job done. <laughs> oh, so sad. So no, I got to say this thing is worth every single, single freaking penny we've spent on it. This oh, thing is oh. beautiful. Yep. The only thing I can say that I'm disappointed about it is that from the pictures online, it looked like it was going to be one of those heavy, really rugged rubberized, like, you know, you could kick it across the room, you know, professional black, really dangerous devices. But upon further inspection, it's relatively light, which I guess is good weight-wise because carrying it around. But it's not – it doesn't feel like it's the strongest plastic. I it mean, is, I'm though. I'm sure you could kick it across the room no problem, but it doesn't have that feel of I am tough and badass and you could beat the shit out of me. So you're saying that perception matters more than reality to you? No. What I'm saying is that I really like that uh, when devices are all rubberized and, yeah. and have the thick plastic. And this one, I thought it was going to be like that, and it was not. We could rubberize it. Ooh. That might interfere with the internal microphone and the speaker, though. It doesn't matter. My, my only real complaint is the internal microphone is pretty good in stereo, but it's not great, and I think I'm still going to have to drop like 100 bucks or two on a real boundary microphone. Yeah, a boundary microphone is also something we've been looking into, and I think we'll just have maybe uh, – we're not going to need one for a long while now, so let's just hold off on that and use our I money mean, for something else. I mean, at the earliest, is going to be December. We're not, probably not even going to need it then. Probably, February will definitely need We're going to need one in February, probably. So maybe we, earlier for Ubercon. Maybe. You're right. It depends. Because I kind of want to record a whole session of Burning Wheel. Mm, good call. But yeah, we won't need one for a few months at the least. And six months at the most, probably. So we'll hold off on that and buy other things instead. But yeah, at any rate, I'm sorry if this was a little bit slower than our normal format of Geek Nights. A little less give and take. Uh, I was avoiding talking as much as I can let myself avoid talking. And uh, fix your throat for tomorrow because yeah. I don't want to have to talk about some video game or something with uh, alone. I expect by tomorrow we'll be back at our full stride. Yep. So if you're going to judge Geek Nights based on episodes you're listening to, I'd listen to at least one more before you judge Isn't it. Isn't that just awesome how when we, you know, when we create the theoretical influx of new listeners from convention season, we make the crappiest shows we can make and we mess up putting an episode online and... Yeah. It might be something to do with the fact that we always go out of town for pretty much two weeks right after we get all these new listeners. Maybe that's not the best strategy for listeners, but it's a great strategy for us. Yes, I needed that week. God damn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, well. Uh, tune in the rest of the week, and by next week, we'll be probably... Next week will probably be, like, the best four awesome episodes of Geek Nights ever. Assuming that every episode of Geek Nights is better than the last. And assuming that none of us die. That could happen. I might poison you. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontroadcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. 
Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays, we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says Send Me an Audio" on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it, as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.